Welcome to our continuing study in Luke's Gospel. Uh, we are coming up on the Winter Olympics, you may have heard. And uh, I, I saw a, a reference on a sports show the other day to the miracle on ice. Anybody remember 1980, the American hockey team came out of nowhere to defeat the Russian hockey team. Was something was never supposed to happen. Miracle on ice. It was in 2009 that um, uh, Captain Ch uh, Chesley Sullenberger, Sully Sullenberger, landed that plane on the river in New York. Do you remember when his engines went out? They call that the miracle on the Hudson. Our culture loves miracles. I mean, uh, just this last Christmas season, I saw it again. Miracle on 34th Street, you know, the, the old Santa movie. Our culture loves miracles, except the ones in the Bible. Because the ones in the Bible are religious superstition. Uh, the, their word for miracle is just a really neat thing that they didn't expect, as opposed to a divine hand at work in the world. The thing about miracles, uh, G.K. Chesterton said uh, a century ago, a great Christian writer, he said the incredible thing about miracles is they actually happen. <laughs> there are true miracles. And Luke's Gospel is filled with them. Miracles were one of the hallmarks of the ministry of Jesus. They were, they were like a calling card for Christ claims to be divine. In fact, in, um, in John's gospel, they're called signs. That's his word for miracles. Signs. Signs give us information, right? Signs point us in the right direction. Think about highway signs. Uh, the signs of John's gospel were the miracles that Christ performed as indicators, as evidence of the fact that he was the Son of God that he claimed to be. And so in Luke's Gospel, that comes through really clearly. Liberal Christianity has decided long ago that the miracle claims in Scripture are either myth or, or metaphor, that they cannot be literally true. Uh, we've, we've talked before, I think, in this class about the fact that Thomas Jefferson, one of our greatest founding fathers, created what he called Jefferson's Bible by clipping out, literally with scissors from his Bible, clipping out all the miracles of the New Testament. And what was left, he said, was the Bible. You can't do that. You can't take scissors to Scripture and still say you value God's Word. Because you become the judge then of what is truth, rather than God himself in his own book. So, when Luke records miracles of Jesus, and that's what our study is about today, uh, Luke, Luke records something over 20 different miracles of Jesus. Uh, he does so because of the critical importance, the role that they play in testifying to who Jesus is and what he came to do. Those 20 miracles don't include all the times when Luke or the other gospel writers add and then he went on to heal everybody else. You know, they'll tell us a, a story of miraculous healing and then add and this is just the tip of the iceberg because he healed everybody who came. So we have no idea the number. Uh, it must have been enormous the number of lives that Jesus changed by miraculous means. But we do have some stories and we'll look at two of those stories today. As we do, keep in mind, I think it's helpful to think in categories here. There are miracles in Luke in which Jesus shows his power over nature. Walking on water, for instance, multiplying the loaves and fishes. There are miracles in Luke in which he shows his power over evil spirits. Uh, one of the uh, uh, stories in the section of Luke that we're looking at today, although not in our actual text, is, is Jesus uh, saving the man who was possessed by evil spirits in the tombs on the other side of Galilee and was terrorizing a whole town 
through his madness because of his possession and Jesus delivered him. There are miracles in Luke in which Jesus shows his power over disease. The two we're going to talk about today fit in that category. And there are miracles in Luke where Jesus shows his power over death. So if he has power over nature, over the supernatural as well as the natural in evil spirits, over disease and over death, that's a comprehensive claim for the power of God through Christ. Now, the, the status of the people that he chooses to heal today are very much a part of Luke's message as well. Um, Jesus preached in that hometown synagogue sermon that we looked at recently that he was the Messiah based on Isaiah 61. The Messiah came for the poor, for the imprisoned, for the downtrodden. And here we see, again, signs of Jesus' care and Jesus' concern for and involvement with the outsiders in society, the marginalized, the forgotten people, or intentionally neglected people here. Uh, Luke's book so emphasizes this that some writers have called it the gospel of the underdog. That Jesus came for those who were forgotten by everybody else. And we see today two examples of that. Some of the fiercest criticism that Jesus got from his Jewish religious opposition was for the people that he associated with. The group that he chose to befriend, uh, to spend time with, to share a meal with. And he did that intentionally as a part of this inclusive message of the gospel that God, unlike society, doesn't draw these lines that exclude people but God draws lines that bring them in. And the ministry of Jesus exemplifies that. So example number one in our lesson today is the healing of a servant of a Roman centurion. We are in Luke chapter seven in the quarterly. A miracle of healing that must have uh, been of particular interest to Luke because Luke, we find out elsewhere in the New Testament, was a physician. And so he would have been tuned in to that, particularly interested in the maladies and in the cures that Jesus brought through his healing. Jesus is the great physician who comes to bring physical healing, but also spiritual healing as a part of his ministry, of course. Luke would also have been interested in this because Luke was a Gentile. And so was a Roman centurion. Again, Gentiles being the non-Jews. Um, Luke was Greek and coming into the culture of Israel he came in as an outsider he came in as one who was unclean because all Gentiles were supposed to be presumed to be uh, spiritually unclean uh, but Luke knew of the cleansing power of the gospel and Luke had his antennae up for other Gentiles who could benefit from this story. In fact, Luke dedicates this book and volume two of his work, which is the book of Acts, to a man named Theophilus, who was almost certainly uh, a Gentile, probably Roman official. He calls him most excellent Theophilus. That's an honorific title. Um, like when we address a judge as your honor. Um, most excellent Theophilus would have been perhaps a seeker after the truth, and Luke is sharing the story of Jesus with him, or perhaps a new Christian. The word Theophilus means lover of God. This may have been his given name. It may have been a Christian name that this new convert took, if he was in fact a new convert. We'd like to know more about him. But uh, Luke, Luke is addressing his, his whole work in the New Testament to a Gentile for the purpose of, of calling attention to the fact that Jesus came not just for the Jews, but to, to work through the Jewish people to reach the rest of the world. God's plan was to come through a nation that would then reach the other nations with the gospel. And so we start our reading in chapter 7 at verse 1. When Jesus finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. 
uh, Capernaum. We met recently that town on the Sea of Galilee that Jesus chose as kind of an unofficial headquarters when he was in the north. Much of his ministry took place around the Sea of Galilee. Uh, it, was, it was his base of operations of sorts when he was not in Jerusalem in the south. There was a Roman garrison stationed in Capernaum. Uh, that's why there was a Roman centurion there. Uh, we don't know for sure, but it may be that the Roman garrison was stationed there because there was a tax office in Capernaum that they would have been very interested in uh, providing uh, Roman protection for because great sums of money would pass through there. We know that because Matthew was the tax collector in Capernaum who became a disciple of Jesus. And so, so much of Jesus' ministry took place in and around Capernaum. This one involves a soldier from that garrison. Our text says, There a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. Centurion. Centurions were the backbone of the Roman army. Um, it's difficult to determine what the equivalent rank would be for us in our military uh, today, because centurions were on a scale of importance. Uh, some centurions who were in charge of a century, that's where the word comes from, of men, in this case not meaning a hundred years, but a hundred men. When the legion, when the Roman legion was at full strength, each unit had a hundred soldiers in it. That was mostly at wartime, so at other times perhaps 80, 85, 90 soldiers. But the, the leader is called a centurion. <clears throat> if they were over a century of men who were not so very strategically placed, then their rank as centurion would be a little bit lower than other centurions who were over centuries of men who were in um, high target areas or important places of assignment. Capernaum seems to be one of those important places. This centurion would have been of a higher rank and the closest we can come is perhaps first lieutenant or captain in that range uh, who would be in charge of soldiers of strategic value to Rome. What happened next is surprising, to say the least. Centurion living in Capernaum is not surprising. His servant is sick, even sick unto death. That's not surprising. That happens. But what happens next is surprising. These elders of the Jews came to Jesus and pleaded earnestly with him, this man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation. What? The Jewish nation that was despised by Rome. Rome Roman uh, officials hated to be posted to Israel. They, they didn't like the region, they didn't like the climate, and they didn't like the people. Um, they didn't like their stubborn claims of monotheism in a Roman world that was polytheistic. They didn't like the fact that the, the Jews refused to worship their emperor as a god, for instance. But here is a Roman centurion of some importance who loves the Jewish nation, and then their, their message to Jesus continues, he has built our synagogue. Out of his pocket, he paid for the construction of a Jewish house of worship. We aren't told. It sounds like he may have been what's called in Scripture a God-fearer. Uh, a Gentile who did not totally convert. That would have included circumcision. That would have included uh, dietary observations. That would have probably cost him his job in the military. Um, but he, a, a, a God-fearer is one who, while he may not totally convert to the Jewish faith, believes in the Jewish God and has faith in him. And uh, that, that's probably what's happening here with this Roman centurion, a Roman who loves the Jews and Jewish leaders who can't say enough nice things about a Roman soldier. What's, what's that line from Ghostbusters about doomsday, cats and dogs living together? It's, 
this is the kind of thing you don't expect to see. And uh, it, it, it's an anomaly for the day. Verse 6, so Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. Uh, surely intentional on Luke's part here to contrast what the Jewish elders said and what the centurion said. They said, Lord, he deserves this favor. And he said, I don't even deserve to have you under my roof. What refreshing humility that is when others sing your praise. And it relieves you of the necessity of singing your own praise in that case. There is a, there's a factor in this, um, which is that observant Jews were not supposed to enter a Gentile's house. Gentiles were unclean. Gentile homes were unclean. And so uh, he would have been asking Jesus to violate part of the code of holiness as they understood holiness, as they defined holiness in their culture. He wanted to remove any necessity of that. And he was also saying, I don't believe that proximity is necessary. You can heal from wherever you are. If you will just, the text says, if you will just say the word, my servant will be healed. When Jesus heard this, verse 9, he was amazed at him. Oh, we saw in the previous story in Capernaum that the hometown crowd, well, at first in Nazareth, the hometown crowd in his hometown synagogue was amazed when Jesus said he was the Messiah, but not amazed in a, right, in a, in a positive way. But the fishermen on Galilee were amazed at the miraculous catch. They were amazed in the right way, and they followed Jesus. Now here, that, the same idea, Jesus is amazed now, but he's amazed at this Gentiles' faith that is so remarkable and so strong. The text says, turning to the crowd following him, he, Jesus, said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. Example number one. Example number two is an unclean woman. It takes place in the next chapter, in chapter 8. In the intervening verses, Christ had taken a boat to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, to the Gentile region of that area, and that's where he had cast the evil spirit out of the man in the tombs. Now he is returning to the western shore of the Sea of Galilee and the area around Capernaum. Um, our quarterly picks up this pericope. A pericope is a, is a standalone portion of the gospel story. Our, our text picks it up in mid-sentence, probably for reasons of space. But let's go back to the beginning of the thought. Um, chapter 8, verse 40 is where we'll pick up our reading. Now when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. The ministry of Jesus falls into three periods, each of which lasted about a year. Um, Bible Scholars call them sometimes the year of obscurity, when Jesus is not well known and just beginning to build a reputation among the people. The year of popularity, when he's widely known and wildly popular among the people. And then the year of opposition, when the religious leaders turn up the heat and begin to plan how we can rid ourselves of Jesus. This event then would have occurred Sometime in that transition from obscurity to popularity, the crowd is so big here, Jesus is almost crushed in the crowd as he tries to make his way to Jairus' house. On his way, he's interrupted. A woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. Uh, it's speculation. Luke doesn't go into detail. 
but from the description of her medical problem and uh, also of her hope to remain unnoticed, her hope to stay anonymous in this. Most scholars agree that this was most likely a gynecological problem. One thing we know, it would have disqualified her from attendance at the synagogue. A, a discharge of blood meant um, a required absence until the situation was cleared up and hers was not cleared. Month after month, year after year, 12 years, she had been separated from the worship of the Lord in temple or synagogue. COVID has interrupted us, but nothing like that. And it's hard to imagine how she must have felt, um, especially when the text says that she had spent everything she had on uh, the care of physicians and no one could help. It seemed to be a chronic problem that was not going away. Verse 44, she came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak and immediately her bleeding stopped. That quickly, that suddenly. Twelve long years and suddenly in a moment she's whole. Her physical situation now is 100% different. But think of the emotional lift. Think of the psychological relief she must have felt because all of that just accumulated over those 12 years. And now it's gone. And her social status is restored among the people. Everything is different now after that touch. Luke gives it one sentence in his book, but it was the world to her no longer the victim of a chronic illness, but she's no longer allowed to be anonymous. Who touched me, Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. What do you mean, who touched you? Probably dozens of people have brushed against you. But Jesus said, someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Now she was healed before he said that, right? She was healed in the previous verse. I wonder if this is the rest of the healing. The testimony to the healing, the openness, the transparency that she was willing to share her, what her problem had been and what God had done for her would have been a significant step toward the healing of that emotional and psychological baggage that she had been under for so long. Twelve years. Jesus had treated her with dignity and kindness even to the point of saying no it's important that you share your story because that's part of your healing too now remember Jesus is on his way to heal Jairus' daughter Jairus was the leader of the synagogue a very important man it would have been so easy for Jesus to say I can't be bothered here instead he stopped and she had his full attention and who was she in her eyes, a nobody. In society's eyes, a nobody. But God saw her as no one else saw her. And he made the difference. Well, the end of the story is not in our lesson. But Jesus arrived at Jairus' house too late. You remember? Jairus' daughter was already dead. The implication, it doesn't specifically say, the implication is that maybe this interruption might have just made it too late. By moments or minutes, perhaps, we don't know. But we do know when Jesus got there, the little girl was dead. And so there's not a third healing in this story. You know, what a, what a nice story that would have been. The healing of the centurion servant, the healing of the woman with the issue of blood, and now the healing of the 12-year-old girl. Oh, well, if Jesus didn't arrive in time to heal, 
he arrived in time to resurrect her. <laughs> and, and he restored life where it had been absent. How do you tell the story of Jesus and leave out the miracles? How do you understand the story of Jesus and leave out the miracles? A first century Christian would not have understood that at all. I hope 21st century Christians don't understand it. Jesus rewrote the story of the centurion servant and he rewrote the story of the woman with the issue of blood and he rewrote the story of Jairus, his daughter. But then Jesus rewrites stories every day. So what about this biblical teaching on healing? That's a sensitive subject because frankly it's been abused. It's been perverted by some. There are excesses of emphasis on faith healing from false teachers who make claims that the Bible does not make. I've read this passage again and again. I cannot find it. Maybe you can help me. I cannot find the place where Jesus says to the woman, if you will make a love gift to this ministry, I'll be glad to heal you. <laughs> it's not in there. That's not in there. God can and often does heal when medical science cannot. The presence of the counterfeit does not invalidate the genuine. In fact, the very reason there are counterfeits is because they're imitating the genuine. And so while there may be abuses, there are abuses in this ministry of healing, it does not negate the fact that that is the ministry that Jesus personified on earth and that the scripture tells us to still pray for. Maybe you, I know I, have friends who have stories that exemplify the truth of this particular message because they had medical issues that the doctor and the physician's assistants and all who were on their case said this cannot be resolved and it was. People who are going into surgery when the x-ray showed something on the day before and it didn't show something on the day of the surgery. Things beyond our explanation. God still can heal. I look at healing in four basic principles. Number one starts with our illness. Christians do suffer. We can and will experience illness and disease. I read about a couple who in their in their wedding vows refused to say in sickness or in health because they said to the minister, no, we're Christians and our faith is so strong we will never get sick. Good luck to them because that's not a promise God makes anywhere in scripture. Christians come down with these diseases like everybody else and you know that perfectly well. So do I. Wherever that idea came from, it's not from the Bible and it's not from common sense. So we start with the fact that Christians do suffer like everybody else does. Number two, God can heal and often does, just as we studied today. He may heal instantly. He may heal progressively. He may heal through a touch that no doctor can explain. He may heal through medicines and surgeries and therapy and counseling and sometimes just rest. I believe God's healing hand is in all of those things. But principle number two is that God can heal. Principle number three is he doesn't always choose to. We don't have the mind of God on everything and he doesn't always choose to heal, at least not here. We can and must be 100% sure of his ability to heal. But we pray, don't we? Your will be done. And his will, will, rules. What if he chooses to show his glory through our suffering? What if he chooses to draw people to him because they observe the way that you and I handle suffering? The presence of God with us in our suffering. Principle number three is the God who can heal chooses, doesn't always choose to do so here and now. Principle number four is one day he will. 
One day healing will be universal and complete, total, 100% for all of those who are his. Read Revelation 21 and 22. No more suffering, no more pain, no more death. The leaves of the tree of life are for the healing of the nations, scripture says. And heaven is the ultimate healing. After all, our lives are but a blink in comparison to the endlessness of eternity when God's healing is universal and complete. But stories like the ones we have studied today remind us that by his grace, he can and often does choose to intervene now. That's why we pray for each other as we did today. That's why we have a partnership with God in this whole process to pray the prayer that will unleash the power of God to move and to work as he chooses. I remember at um, a general conference of the Wesleyan Church that was held at Lake Junaluska. It was the second general conference after merger, 1968, so this would have been 1972. I was pastoring a church near Lake Junaluska, and, and Judy and I were able to go. <clears throat> I remember a Sunday afternoon service where a minister from the Caribbean was leading the service and leading us in prayer, and he said these words. He said, I'm going to lead in prayer. Your job is to join me in prayer because, he said, who knows who of us will pray the prayer of faith today that energizes this prayer and that brings about what we're praying for by the goodness of God. That prayer of faith is what God chooses to be a key sometimes that unlocks his power at work in our lives. No guarantees this side of heaven but a track record that cannot be overlooked of honest to goodness miracles of healing that God can and often does on our behalf. Let's pray together. Lord, your goodness is overwhelming. We are so grateful to you for all that you are and all that you've done. Our own physical welfare is important to you because you love us. And you will be there for us through whatever we go through. Sometimes, Lord, you are willing to remove those obstacles from us and we thank you for it. Uh, may our faith stay strong. Whatever your answer is, we still trust you. In Jesus' name, amen.